thanks for joining us today. I want to invite you to worship with us, to sing, to give God everything you got right there, right where you are. Join us.
Well, praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, and welcome to our service. Today, we're going to talk about unstoppable power because the Lord Jesus has given us the victory. So let there be victory in your life. And I hope you're hungry this morning for the Word of God because we're going to be talking from Hebrews chapter 4 all the way down to verse 13. And we're going to enjoy the Word today. Hallelujah, because... In Him is the fullness of joy. And when we are in His Word, folks, we are in the fullness of joy. So this is going to be about rest. It's going to be about peace. But we're going to focus in on verse 12 and 13 today. Hallelujah. We're going to break it down. We're going to dig into it. So let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord God. Thank you for what you're about to do this morning in the hearts of all those listening, Lord. And I pray your mighty blessing Upon them, Father, I pray that you would empower them, Lord God, through your word and let them have victory in their lives, O oh God, as they are obedient to your word, O oh God, and keep a heart of repentance at all time, O oh God. That's what keeps us humble before you. That's what keeps our lives sober as we, we are in repentance, Lord God. So, Lord, I just praise your name in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So, if you're hungry, then Matthew 5, 6 tells you right here, it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You're going to be filled, it says, for they shall be filled. Now, let's go to Hebrews 4, 1 to 13. So Hebrews 4, 1 says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, how I many you know that we have to enter into his rest if we are going to be successful in our walk our life we gotta live by faith hallelujah so since there's a promise remain remains of entering his rest let us fear have that fear of god in us lest any of you seem to have come short of it this first part here of hebrews 4 they're talking about the old testament versus the new testament you'll see the difference and i'll explain it as we go for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard, now we're talking about the people in the Old Testament, did not profit them. It says not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So we have to mix faith with the word we hear. Otherwise that we will not be able to enter into that rest. Hallelujah, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. So if it's God's gift to us, that's Ephesians 2, uh, 8, 9, we are saved by grace through faith. So we believe in the grace that he has given to us through his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus was full of truth and grace. In other words, he's got a lot of compassion on us. Every time we fall, he's right there waiting to lift us up. It's not like the Old Testament. So thank you, Lord. Verse 3 says, For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he had said, So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. See, the stubbornness of the people in the Old Testament did not allow them to enter into that rest. For he has spoken in a certain place on the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. That means God rested too. And he looked at everything he made. And everything was good. Praise his name. Hallelujah. There was nothing that God created that wasn't good. Even Lucifer at the beginning was good. But then when sin was found in him pride and he wanted to elevate himself above god above the most high everything else was always good when he created hallelujah see when we are at rest we are at peace and when we are at peace we don't stress out at all the things that the enemy is trying to do because we know that god has our back we are not ignorant of his devices the bible says if we are in his word and if we understand who who god is and who the enemy is and what jesus has done and how the enemy has been defeated we can be at rest 
not having to worry about, well, is the enemy going to... We are not ignorant through his word. Everything was good in the garden. Everything was good on earth. Everything was created. And then he creates Adam. And then Eve. And both of them were at rest. And I picture this rest here like this. Just not necessarily with your eyes closed, but the symbol is with the eyes closed. You're just resting. You're not taking a little nap from all the hard work you've done. Yeah, I could just see God just kind of saying, it's all good. I'm going to take a nice little nap. But he can't because he, he's a spear, but he rests from his work that he done. I wrote down here, Adam and Eve were at rest till their eyes were opened by the sound of the crunch. You know, they took the forbidden fruit. First it was Eve, and then she gave it to Adam. And the Bible says, and their eyes were opened. So now all of a sudden, they're not at rest anymore because they're awake. They've, they're awakening themselves to a whole new world that's fallen. Hallelujah. Now the enemy can come in and do what he needs to do with them or what he desires to do with them because they felt the temptation, they disobeyed God and basically relinquished what God had given them to the enemy. It sounded good. It sounded sweet. When they were at rest and the next thing you know, they take that crunch and oh no, what have I done? And so it's just an image that the Lord showed me. They were at rest till their eyes were opened by the sound of a crunch. And when that happened, they lost their innocence. God always wants to keep us in a sense innocent like a child so that we can always come before him <laughs> god is good folks hallelujah no verse 5 says and again in this place they shall not enter my rest since therefore it remains that some must enter it and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience so disobedience keeps you at arm's length of rest you cannot rest when you are in disobedience. And we can see that in the Jewish people of Jesus' day, how they were. They were not at rest. Every time Jesus came around, they were stirred up inside, but in the wrong way. Because the enemy was there. The enemy was in them. But Jesus was pure, hallelujah, and holy. Whatever he said, whatever he did, was always into opposition of what they thought inside so they were never at rest because they never obeyed the word of god and they never believed that jesus christ was the son of god again it says here verse 7 he designates a certain day saying in david today after such a long time as it has been said today if you will hear his voice do not harden your hearts the pharisees and the people before you know do you know that when jesus was living he was living in the old testament right okay you need to understand that even though it's written quote new testament on your bible matthew mark luke and john was old testament really that's what it was okay so just to let you understand that he says here do not harden your hearts for if joshua had given them rest then he would not have afterward have spoken of another day Therefore, there remains a rest. There still remains a rest for the people of God. But that rest is only in Jesus. Hallelujah. It's being at peace. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. You are in faith, fully trusting in God for what he's done. That is your rest. Praise his holy name. For he who has entered into his rest, say, that's me. That's me. That's me. I've entered into his rest. That means you've ceased from your works as God did from his. You don't have to work for your salvation. It's already been done for you. That means you just walk by faith in him. Trust in him for everything. Trust in him for all things in your life. Hallelujah. Don't be the master of your life anymore. Let Jesus be the master in your life, let his Holy Spirit in you guide you every single day. Glory to God. That's what entering in his rest is all about. Walking by faith, 
and having that peace that passes all understanding in you, having that joy no matter what happens. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. This is getting really good already, man. I'm telling you, I'm starting to get filled up a bit here because it's so good. Hallelujah. Now, verse 11 says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall. See, when you're not in that rest, you're so apt to fall, apt to go back to the old things because you're saying it's impossible to, to do this. You're living Old Testament style. you got to just relax in Him and let Him guide you. It says, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Say with me, my rest kicks in when I believe and obey. Just say that. My rest kicks in when I believe and when I obey. Hallelujah. There's a lot of joy with that that comes with that. When you're in obedience to his word, you know you're following what Jesus said. You know what you're doing. You're walking in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. You're just being you, but in Jesus. Hallelujah. You're going to be joyful. You're going to feel that peace inside of you. Glory to God. Now, these last two verses we're going to look at. It says, for the word of God is living. I'm going to take this time really, real slow here. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, we look at all those words. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Scary stuff scary stuff and there is no creature no creature that means any man any woman any child hidden from his sight that's not only that but animals everything nothing god sees everything all the time hallelujah but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him of whom we must give account hallelujah so I'm going to say it like this. To me, personally, verse 12 and 13, the last two verses we just read, are arguably the scariest. And what I mean by the scariest is it puts the fear of the living God in me. But at the same time, they're the most reassuring two verses of Scripture in the Bible. Verse 12 and 13 puts the fear of God in my heart and it should in yours because it has seven definitive or very definitive words. If you're serious about the word of God, it will keep you very sober in a very drunken world. Now, let me explain that. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean alcohol. Having a sound mind versus a mind that doesn't know what it's doing. It's got no, no straight thoughts about God or the Word, and, and you're just allowing yourself to see everything, and everything is disturbing. So it keeps your mind not at ease. You're not in your right place up here. You can't focus. So these words, if you begin to understand what these words are saying here, these two verses, it's going to keep you very sober if you receive that. Very sober. It's going to keep you, whoa, God is serious, but God is love. God is joy. You'll, you'll see the whole spectrum of God as you begin to get into His Word and study His Word. Hallelujah. Because this world is very, very drunk. More than just alcohol. Way more than just alcohol. It's drunk in stupidity and in hate. It's drunken in all kinds of sin. If you are serious about God and His Word, this will keep you very sober in a very drunken world. Hallelujah. It will narrow down your world and change you into someone very specific. You know what God wants to make you into someone very specific? Everybody in this world is a unique person. Now God wants to take your talents, your abilities, whoever you are, and make that into a specific person in his body. Hallelujah. In the church. I got a thought here. Isn't it amazing when heaven zooms in on you, according to his word, 
That's why I like to see it. For the word of God is living. It's powerful and sharper than any twidget sort of. It's, it goes down into your intents and the thoughts and everything about you. It's like heaven zooming in on you. I love that. It's scary, but I love it. Now, regardless, that's telling me that God is interested in me enough to go into every part of my being physically, emotionally, spiritually, and examine everything and know exactly what's working, what's not. That's amazing in my understanding of the Word of God. It's amazing when it can zoom in with the purpose to increase God's goodness in your life. That's what he wants to do. So he goes in and he zooms in and he checks everything out. He says, this is not good, Dennis. You need to get rid of that. This here, you can improve with that. This here is right on. I love the way you're coming beautifully into this. But that's got to go. That's got to go. That's got to go. You're convicted inside. Praise his name. It's so good, folks. The word of God is so good for you. It's an eternal reminder that God is mindful of you. And that we, in return, should be mindful of him. Have you ever wondered what unstoppable power looks like? Well, this is it. When you enter into this and you take God's word and understand it, that it's so living, it's so powerful, and it pierces, that is unstoppable power. This is it, folks. This is what unstoppable power looks like. This is a God can do all things scripture. I'm giving you my perspective and my understanding of what these verses are. And I'm excited inside, folks. If you read Matthew 19, 26 over and over and receive it, you'll understand. It says, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. We serve a God of the impossible. Now, let's do a book-to-book -book comparison here. I did some research. The Library of Congress in the States says that its collection fills about 838 miles. Now, that's mind-boggling. It contains about 838 miles or 1,349 kilometers of bookshelves. It holds more than 167 million items with over 39 million books and other prints, print materials. That includes audio, videos, all kinds of stuff. This is where those in Congress, the lawmakers, look to study all kinds of stuff. This is their library, the largest library in the world. Think about this now for a second. Out of all those books, all of them, there is only one that is living. There is only one that is alive. All those other books, folks, are dead. They could be books of laws. They could be fictional books. They got no eternal value. Only the Word of God has eternal value. Only the Bible has eternal value. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That's got to do something for you on the inside. What you have in your hands is no ordinary book, folks. No ordinary book. And what you have inside of you isn't from the earth. Think about that. You have Jesus inside of you. That seed is from heaven. Because Bible says that seed is incorruptible. Hallelujah. Jesus is the word. And that word became flesh. The seed is the word of God. The Bible is a book of seeds, a book of scriptures. And those scriptures are seeds. Hallelujah. That when you implant in your spirit, in your heart, and you water them, and you continue to live by faith and believe, they grow and they change you. Hallelujah. So ask yourself a question about unstoppable power. That's the power that gives us all the victory we need. What does that look like in your life? There is a process involved in all of our lives that will lead us into a place of unstoppable power and authority. We have it already, but we just need to find out more about it. And it's in his word. I'll give an example, Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give unto you power. That means authority. To thread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now that word, over all the power of the enemy, is over the ability of the enemy, or the abilities of the enemy. Whatever he has, you have the authority over that. Ah, that's a big check, man. That's a, huh! 
in heaven. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So you can be in that place, but you need to study the word and find out and grow in faith. Find out more about him. Acts 1, 8 says, you shall receive power. Jesus is about ready to ascend to heaven. This is one of his last little talks here with the boys and the 120 that were there. He says, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses. This power is going to help you to become witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and over all, of, all over the world. Now that word is not the same word as, behold, I give unto you power. That's authority. This one here is a word called dunamis. That's where we get the word dynamite from. Kaboom! <laughs> See, God's got all kinds of power. Unstoppable means it cannot be stopped. I really believe we're living in a year that God wants to show us his unstoppable power. That power that keeps bulldozing through. Hallelujah. It's unstoppable in you because of what's inside of you. If you don't have Jesus inside of you, you're the one that's getting trampled all the time. But when you have that unstoppable power inside of you and you know about it and you know how to activate it by faith, you're the one that's trampling. You're the one that's bulldozing through. Hallelujah. In victory after victory after victory. Glory to God. God is so good, folks. Give him praise. Even if I don't see you guys, just stop and just get up and just jump. Hallelujah. And just get right back down and listen again. Because God is so good. You can explode at your end and I'll explode at mine. Praise his holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. See, because of the seed that is in you, the things of heaven can flow through you now. Praise his name. See, that seed, that incorruptible seed of 1 Peter 1, 23, where it says, born again, not of corruptible, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So it's talking about an incorruptible seed here. Thank you, Jesus. See, the smallest, tiny, little bit of heaven can crush the enemy. Glory to God. And what's inside of you is something that can never, 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 never lose its power. That is so, 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 so reassuring that our God doesn't change. In Malachi 3, 6, it says, For I am the Lord your God, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Hallelujah. I change not. God doesn't change. New Testament, Old Testament, it doesn't matter. God's ways, God's character. Now, the covenant changes because of Jesus. So now there's things we don't do no more because of Jesus. But God doesn't change. His love is the same. His peace, His joy, everything is the same from the beginning, from the very, very beginning. And there's no beginning of God. And that is unexplainable. What do you want me to tell you? I don't know. Nobody's got that answer. Praise God. He always existed. He is self-existent throughout eternity. Hallelujah. So his word by nature cannot be stopped. Certainly our disobedience, though, could slow it down. If God's going to work through us, we have to be open. We have to be able and available to work through that. I mean, when God tells you something, we obey. When we read his word and he tells us what to do in his word, we obey that. When we are obedient, he freely flows through us. But when we're disobedient and when we put our heels in the sand and we go, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, oh, I'm not ready for that yet. Then you're slowing his power to work through you down. Okay? You're slowing it down. But imagine what can happen if we obey and we do what it says. See, everything contained in the seed remains dormant until it is planted in the right soil and in the right environment. So that's when you become repentant. That's when you receive him. You don't receive him with an arrogant heart. Say, Lord God, I believe you are the son of God. Hallelujah. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you've forgiven my sins. I receive that, Lord. Come and live your life with me. Change me, Lord God. I'm turning away from the things that I used to do. Help me, Lord God, to turn away. Even though I may not fully turn away, help me, Lord God, to keep turning away from the things that I used to do. When you repent, and even though you still have habits, it don't matter. He'll clean you up as you go. You don't need to be clean. But if you have that right attitude... Oh my goodness, that's the right environment. 
That's the right soil for him to come in and go, boop, my word is right there. It's covered up. Let it grow now. Now we're going to grow together. My spirit is in you. Let us go forward. Hallelujah. Don't keep the seed on the sideline of your life like a spare part. It's got to grow. you got to feed yourself the word of God. you got to feed yourself in the presence of God. you got to worship him. Hallelujah. Those are just a, the beautiful things that helps you grow. Praise his name. Is this good for you right now? It's going to get better. Thank you, Lord. The seed, which is his word, is the infusion of his love into your very being. Imagine that. Getting an injection from heaven. A love injection, a love infusion into your heart when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It's that agape love that really kicks off the process towards maturity. Realizing that how much he loves me. For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved to the highest degree. That's for you. Hallelujah. It's the platform by which all good things begin to grow now. See, you can't find that anywhere outside of Jesus. You can't find that anywhere outside of Christ. It's impossible. There's only one place and it comes from heaven. Everything else on this earth that you look around and see is a product of a fallen world. A world that disobeyed God. A world that continues to disobey God. And it is basically under control from the enemy until you come out of that control and you let Holy Spirit work his control in you. Let him control your life. Hallelujah. But it's not a control that he controls you. No, it's something that you allow him to. Lord God, take control of my life. I'm giving you permission. The enemy doesn't give you permission. Satan just controls you, does whatever he wants all the time. This here seed and this here is exclusive only to the believer in Jesus. Now, listen to my next statement. Those who refuse the inclusiveness of Jesus. Remember what John 3.16 says. For God so loved the world or all the people of the world. All of them. That he gave his only begotten son. And he died for all the sins of the world. Those who refuse that kind of inclusiveness, the inclusiveness of Jesus, that means any sinner, any man, woman, or child can be included or become part of who Jesus is in his church. But those who refuse that inclusiveness exclude themselves to the exclusiveness of the most powerful platform by which all good things grow. If you refuse the inclusiveness of Jesus, that he says, to all may come. All may come, he says. It's basically saying, we have blessings, we have stuff that the world doesn't have. That's what it's being exclusive means. That's what I'm saying. The world doesn't have what I've got. So I'm exclusive because I am in him. But everybody can come to that. Hallelujah. God is so good. Therefore, we need to learn to love God like never before. However deep your love for Jesus is, there's a whole lot more to go. There's a whole lot more to receive. And that's a real good thing because God is a God without limits. If you want lots of love, receive the love that he has for you. Yeah, same with peace, love, joy, everything. Thank you, Lord Jesus. However deep your love for Jesus is, there's a whole lot more to go. And that's a really good thing. And you're developing faith in Christ through trials and testings and tribulations, all those things. Nobody said it was going to be easy following Jesus, guys. Don't think that you just go lay down and angels are going to drop grapes in your mouth and then have the fans blowing and saying, you know what? You're in. You're in. Just enjoy it. I'm going to feed you grapes. Don't even move. Don't do nothing. No. We're going to have to go through. There's daily things. The world doesn't change. We're still walking on our two feet on this earth. We're still going to the same place to work with the same problems, but now you're a different person. So you're developing your faith through tests and trials. That's what's going to push that development in your new life in Christ. That's what's going to mature you. Your diligence of all things Jesus. In other words, our focus from now on 
is got to be Jesus and his word. I'm not saying 24 hours a day in the Bible. I'm not saying praying every single moment. You don't, you don't care about nobody else. No, it's not that. You just apply the word of God in your life every day. You talk to people. You witness when you get a chance. If you learn to love, you've got to practice that on people. You have to work it out. The Bible says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Praise his holy name. So you're learning to apply the agape love of God to those around you. You are increasing in self-control and humility. Those are all things that you're growing in. Your kindness towards others is visibly seen. People are recognizing the goodness of Jesus flowing from your actions. The joy of the Lord and your heart radiates like the sun. Read the last part of chapter 7 of the book of Acts. When Stephen, just before he's about to get stoned there, it didn't take long after that. He's just radiating. He said they saw like a face of an angel. People can see the peace that you're enjoying. When everything else is falling around, when all the stresses and all the problems of this world, that creates all kinds of hardness on you and all kinds of discontentment. And that's bad for your health, physically, spiritually, emotionally. But when you have peace, the real Hebrew meaning for that is, well, part of it is nothing missing in your life, nothing broken. Your patience is beginning to look like God's patience. Your gentleness is thoroughly noticeable. Now you're beginning to look like Jesus. His character is oozing out of you. The devil is a liar when he tells you otherwise. God is working in you no matter what. You're not perfect. You never will be. But in that imperfection, God is still working in you. And you will be noticed. People will see the change in your life. And even if they're not 100% seeing you, all of it right now, don't worry about it. The devil is always going to be a liar as he whispers to you. He wants to get you off course. But Jesus wants to keep you on track. On the track of growth in him. Hallelujah. And so all of that adds up to unstoppable power despite all your imperfections. Despite all my imperfections. So what you have is power that cannot be stopped. Say, that's very good news. Very good news. Thank you, Lord. That means that anyone that tries to stop it will not be successful. Can I get an amen on that? Hallelujah. I know this is online, but can I still get an amen on that last statement? You know, no matter what he tries, he will not be able to stop. He will not be successful. Hallelujah. Go with me. For a second here to Romans 8, 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. In other words... Whatever we go through, we are still more than conquerors. We can get beat up sometimes, I'm speaking figuratively here, or spiritually beaten up, or we can have a hard week, a hard month, and sometimes we just feel like we're so beaten down. But in all that, you're more than a conqueror. Hallelujah. He says it right there. Yet in all these things that he just previously said in verse 35 and 36, okay, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, Paul says, that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Say it again. That is very good news. Say it again. Amen. Hallelujah. Now here comes another question. What does that kind of power look like in me, look like in you, look like for the church of Jesus Christ? This year, we are going to tap into something deeper by faith. That faith that's in us. We have stuff inside of us too that needs to come out. We're going to tap into that by faith. Hallelujah. Something that we don't fully know. We're going to find out what it's all about. We know it's God's power and we know it's unstoppable. Now, let's see what the Word of God has to say about this power according to those last two verses I read at the beginning. 
Now, notice the transformation or a process of going deeper and deeper as a transforming agent. That Word of God that we have, that Bible that you got in your hands, the Bible that you read every day, hopefully, that Bible there is an agent of transformation if we believe it. If we trust God in those verses for our lives, we will be transformed and changed into His likeness. We're going to look at seven words. Say seven words are going to change my life. Hallelujah. Now let's break it down. It says, for the word of God is living. So if you got your Bible, just go back to Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. It says, for the word of God is living. Now that word living is the first word we're looking at. And it's the Greek word zao. Part of that word, live, I, I believe it's zoe. So it, it's that zao, zoe kind of word. It means to live. It means to breathe, to be among the living. And it's talking about the word now. For the word of God is living. And so I'm breaking it down to you specifically what the Word of God is all about. And that's the Word of God that is in you. That seed that was implanted in you. That seed is alive. That seed is zeo in you. Hallelujah. To be among the living. Not lifeless. Not dead. So remember I said about the Library of Congress? It's all dead. But except for the Bible, which is there in the Library of Congress in the States, that is the only living book. It means to enjoy real life. To have true life and worthy of the name. Praise his name. It means living water. Having vital power in itself. And exerting the same upon the soul. Ooh. See, it's living. It's doing stuff inside of you. It's active. It's working. The Bible says, the King James Version says it's quick. It's quick and powerful. Ooh. Quickens you. Quicken means it livens you. Makes you alive in Him. Hallelujah. Means to be in full vigor. You know, I'm reminded of Caleb at, at age 85. He's 85 years old. Caleb, Joshua and Caleb from the Old Testament. They went into the promised land. They were with Moses when they were younger. Then when Moses died, they went forward, uh, led by Joshua into the land of promise, land of Canaan, the, the promised land. And uh, at 85, as the years went by, when they were conquering and conquering and conquering at 85 he remembers man i want that piece of land i want that mountain over there that piece of land on the mountain there i want that i'm just as strong as i was when i was 40 years old he was in full vigor hallelujah he says i can still do this right now come on man just give it to me josh come on i can go up there i can do it i can take it it's my land you give it to me ah, i want it that's the kind of attitude he had inside he was a full vigor and that's what the word of god is like it's there it's always there pushing you trying to push you forward into life hallelujah glory to god it means to be fresh strong efficient active powerful revelations 118 says this i am he who lives and was dead and behold i am alive forevermore amen and i have the keys of hades and death see jesus is the word Jesus is the word, folks, and he's alive forevermore. That means he's alive in us by his Holy Spirit. And that word is alive in us. Whew! I'm very, very passionate right now about this message. The second word says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It's the word energis in the Greek. E-N-E-R-G-E-S, which when we get the word energy, it means active, effective, productive, energetic. Full of energy. So the Word of God is alive, but it's not only alive, it's got energy to it. Hallelujah. Keep that in your heart. It's alive and it's energetic. And then it goes on to say, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. The Greek word there is tomoteros. T-O-M-O-T-E-R-O-S. That word means sharper. So the Word of God is alive, it's powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. It means to cut by a single stroke as opposed to another kind of a sword that's not as sharp as the Word of God. It's the sharpest sword available. Basically, there's Word of God, which is sharper than any other two-edged sword, and then there's the other ones. Now, the other ones, in order to break through, sometimes you got to cut and hack and hack and cut and cut and hack, and it doesn't do the job right. But God's Word is sharper 
to cut with precision. Hallelujah. Some of those swords that we have, these books, they'll try to give you some kind of self-help. And you're just hacking away. You're not getting anywhere. Your heart is never touched. But this here goes into your heart. Slices in clean. Goes in deeper. So it's go, we're going deeper now. So it's, it's alive. It's powerful. Now it's sharper. Now we're going in deeper. In actuality, where the word of God is effective is when it is spoken. So the actual meaning of this is two mouth as a split river. It's a two mouth sword, which can be looked at as it was made for God's mouth and it was made for our mouth. When we become born again, filled with the Spirit of God, we are allowed to use the full authority of his word, just like God used it when he created stuff. Whatever he spoke, we can speak in the same manner. We have been given that authority. We are to speak his word. Hallelujah. So his word in our mouth is sharper than any two-edged sword. Cuts. So it's convicting. Hallelujah. One for the mouth of Jesus and one for us. We have the same purpose with the word as the Lord has. His word is beyond surgical. Hallelujah. Revelation 1.16 says, he had in his right hand, he's talking about Jesus, seven stars out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Out of his mouth came, those are the words. So the word of God is like a two-edged sword, but it is the sharpest two-edged sword ever. Then he goes on to say this. It means piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. Now, the Greek word here is diiknoneomai. It speaks of dichotomy. Dichotomy is to split in two, separate. Hallelujah. So the word of God goes in there and separates from this, separates from that. It does surgical work. Actually, it goes beyond surgical, like I said. It means to go through, to penetrate, to pierce, to operate in the heart of man through conviction and revelation. It convicts us of our sin because it goes into every nook and cranny, everything. Verse 13, the next verse down, it says, Nothing is hidden from him. Nobody can hide. No thoughts. No intents. Well, if I do this, and that will do that. When you're thinking, he's following all your thoughts. He knows exactly what's going on. That's why I said it's scary. That's why I said it puts the fear of God in you because nothing is hidden. He knows everything you're thinking about right now. He knows what your plans are, whether good or bad. He knows if you're being deceived, if you're deceiving, if you're lying. He knows it all. Hallelujah. It's scary. But at least you know that God loves you enough to tell you and convict you by his spirit. And then he reveals to you something. Hallelujah. It operates in our hearts through conviction and revelation. Is the sword of the word penetrating and piercing you. Jesus was pierced by a physical sword. But we are pierced by a much greater sword, his word. His word is sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces through soul and spirit, through all that stuff, right down to all the nooks and crannies of your life, of your heart, of your full being. You want to really know what the word is? The word is a piercing pain in the flesh that heals and restores you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your word. It's still a pain. doesn't mean I have to like it, but it's sometimes do I feel because God has asked me to do something in his word, speaking of my heart. You need to do that. See, that becomes a pain in my flesh, but it's a good pain. Hallelujah. Remember that. Everything about God is good. Thank you, Lord. And then he goes on to say, and as a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, that word discern, it means decisive. God is a sniper. I said this before, but God can go with a, with a sniper rifle at one end of the universe and hit a dime of a shaking man that's holding it like this, you know, right in the middle of it. He's a sniper. He's very decisive, very critical in everything he does. Very discriminative, but not in the sense you think. Another definition of being discriminative means able to recognize or make distinctions with accuracy. 
never a dime. Whew. That's how accurate the word of God is. Hallelujah. Track with me here with my thoughts because sometimes I get really excited. So that word is able to discern the things in your heart, what's going on. It's a discerner of your thoughts and the intents. <laughs> I can't get away with nothing on this world. I used to before, well, I used to think so before when we were deceived. But now, since Jesus came into my heart, <laughs> he knows everything. Praise his name. Hallelujah. See, you can't play games with God. You can't play games with God. He sees right through you. Anything ungodly floating around in your thought life gets arrested immediately and brought before your heart in conviction. What are you doing with that thought, Dennis? What is going on in your head? I know why exactly why you're thinking about that. I'm, that's messing me up. But it's good for me. Hallelujah. It's like that medicine <laughs> when you're a kid and somebody's holding your mouth open. It's good for you because it leaves no stone unturned in your life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He takes your thoughts from a place of carnality and brings them into the conviction zone. Thank you, Lord. I need that. I need that all the time, by the way, because I'm not perfect. If you wonder sometimes what goes on inside of here. Thank you, Jesus, that by his grace I am saved and that by his word I am cleansed. Hallelujah. Now, the last verse says this, and there is no creature hidden from his sight. <laughs> Sorry, find me if you can. I already found you a long time ago. You know, but all things are naked and open in the eyes of him to whom we must give account. That word naked in the Greek means gymno. It means unclad, unarmed. It means naked. The parts not covered by armor. The exposed part. You stand fully exposed before God, guys. That's what it means. You are, so, you are so scanned by his word. It's like, you know, you go through these, these scanners there for your body to see all the problems of your body, those, those MRI machines or whatever, those scanning machines there. <laughs> That's the word of God every day. That's where you're going through and you can see through every little thing. Every day you're going to get scanned. Lord, when you wake up, Lord God, put me through that scanner every day. Put me through that scanner. That's what it's all about. Naked. You're naked on that scanning machine of his word. I'm thankful. I don't like it all the time. You know, sometimes you wish you could just say, okay, you, you, you didn't see that, Lord. You didn't understand that. You didn't. That's just our flesh. God works through that. He, he wants to perfect you. Not make you perfect. He wants to perfect you. Lord knows that until we get there, we'll be that fully perfect person with still the ability to learn more and more and more. Hallelujah. The last word I'm looking at is open. That's a different word. It's a Greek word, trachalizo, where we get the word trachea. Yeah, right over here. It means to seize and twist by the neck or throat of a combatant in the manner he handles the antagonist. In other words, where a guy grabs somebody by the throat. Well, the word of God grabs you by the throat, basically, and lets you know, hey, that's wrong. But he's so gentle in the manner, he grabs you gently by the throat. And he lets you know, that's not good. What you just did there, Dennis, that's not good. I'm sorry, Lord, I'm sorry. <laughs> and he gently takes off. I just, I just wanted to show you why that I can see through all of you. I can see you naked and open. I can, there's that thing that you can hide from me. I got you, but I love you. Hallelujah. He loves you so much. Are we still good? I'm, I'm done here. I'm almost done. Anybody got a sore throat? <laughs> oh boy. See, I believe this year you will have answers you need to know how to walk in this unstoppable power. We are in the last days and we're going to need all the power we can get our hands on. Hallelujah. We need it, man. The enemy's coming on strong, but hey, God is always stronger. Praise you, Lord. Isaiah 60 talks about there's going to be a gross darkness in the land Darkness and a gross darkness, okay, but the glory of the Lord has risen upon us. Hallelujah. The goodness of God has risen upon us. See, that's what the glory of God is, the goodness of God. See, Moses wanted to see his glory. God showed him his goodness. Hallelujah. So that's all we need, really, is that goodness 
of God in us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God has got a limitless supply that we can access by faith of anything. You want love? You want joy? You want peace? You want all the goodness? You can access that by faith in Him. Hallelujah. Believe me when I tell you this, the reason you are here today and you're listening to this here thing is because you are an integral part of God's plan for the church, the body of Christ. And if you're not going to a church where you are, you need to find a place no matter what. Find a place that believes in the Word of God. Hallelujah. It's more than an online thing. I'm glad you're listening to this Word. Find a church that believes in the Bible. Look around. Pray. Ask God where to lead you. The book of Acts ain't finished yet. We're only at chapter 2024 20, here. That's where we're at. The church in action. The church in motion. The church in growth. The church in multiplication. The church full of power of the Holy Spirit. Most movies have a backstory and a present story. And it's with those two stories that keeps that movie going forward. Till the end, you know, till the movie's over. But every one of us have our own movie in our own lives. God's recorded everything, so to speak. And he knows where we were at, where we come from as an infant, as a baby, in our mother's womb. It goes back. We have a beginning until now, until this day. So we have a backstory, and we have a story that's going forward, a now story and, and a future. And God is in all of that. God was also in the past part. He was always with you. He was there from the, from the moment you were conceived in your mother's womb, and even before that. He knew you before you were born. So we all have a backstory. This backstory is what has brought you here now, and God is changing your future and your now. So don't go back in your backstory. Just continue on. Are you ready for what comes next? Are you ready for tomorrow and next week? Are you ready to fight the evil that's in our land? There's a lot of evil in our land. See, David did. And he did it with unstoppable power. King David I'm talking about. David and Goliath I'm talking about. It will test your faith. The important thing we need to understand is that this land belongs to God. And he has given it to us as an inheritance. What I want you to do right now is I want you to listen. Maybe you can even close your eyes. I want you to hear what the Bible says and see if you can picture that battle in your mind. Use your imagination. Pretend that's you. So David's mighty men comes from 2 Samuel 23, verse 8 to 12. And it says, these are the mighty men whom David has. He had Josheb Bashibeth, the Tachamite, chief among the captains. He was called Adino the Esnite because he had killed 800 men at one time. I want you to picture this, okay? This is Old Testament. So yes, they were killing men. They didn't know anything about spiritual warfare. But we have spiritual warfare. So you think of yourself fighting 800 devils with the Word of God. Just imagine he had killed 800 men at one time. So I can picture that. I can picture that sword going back and forth and all the strategies that God was giving him and killed 800 men at one time. In other words, nonstop. Whatever time it took. One long battle scene. Verse 9 says, And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Aohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel had retreated. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. In other words, his hand had taken the shape of the handle of the sword and he wouldn't let go. Okay, the Lord brought a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to plunder. In other words, there was an army there. And these are David's mighty men. One killed 800, what did the other one kill? Well, I'm sure he killed a lot. There was a great victory that day, it says. And the people returned after him only to plunder. In other words, to take their swords, all their stuff that they used. That's called plundering. Verse 11 was Shema, the son of Agi, the Hararite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop, kind of like surrounding him, where there was a, a ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines. But this guy here, Shema, he stationed himself in the middle of the field 
defended it and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. Can you imagine that? Standing there. No way you guys are touching this field here. He killed that troop of Philistines. These are David's mighty men. And we can be that in the spirit, spiritually speaking. We can be that with our authority that comes from this word that is alive, that is powerful, that is quicker, that is sharper than any other sword. Piercing. We stand so powerful in the Lord. Hallelujah. Say with me for the last thing. Let there be victory in my life. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for your word, Lord. And I pray, oh God, that it would sink in, that they would receive your word, oh God. Hallelujah. That we are powerful with your word. That your word is alive. It is full of energy. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It goes down deep inside of us, oh God, in our hearts. It knows everything about us. It scans, Lord God. Let us be, Lord Jesus, let us be active in your word and understanding. Let us wean the wisdom of it, oh God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So bless your word to our lives, to our spiritual lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for listening. And I hope you didn't just listen, but I hope you took it to heart. God bless you. We'll see you next week in Jesus' name. Amen.